Hey everyone, for the last couple of weeks we've been introducing you to this guy, Captain Decelerate. That if you follow his handbook and his way of living, you won't have freedom, you won't have peace, you won't have abundant living. Rather, you will have debt and you will have anxiety and you'll have meager living. In fact, he can be called the official mascot or superhero of Fairfax and Loudoun County. But what if, instead of following his way of living, you could accelerate into the dreams that God has for your life? This week, I want to introduce you to a few people who've been following after God's dreams of their life. And after they've been acting faithful and doing what God is asking them to do, they've been accelerating and they're watching God's dreams come true. I decided instead of going off to a four-year college and paying room and board for all four years, and a lot of times when you're in college, especially when you're living away from home, you can't be working as much. And so it just, for me, felt like I was going to be stuck um, not making money and just paying a lot of money for being there. And so a lot of times middle schoolers, high schoolers, I think more so, who are very close to making that decision about college, it's kind of easy to get caught up in the, the short-sighted vision of, oh, I can't wait for college, that four-year experience, it's so much fun, it's going to be the best, best four years of my life. Um, but in reality, like if you look forward, if you look past those four years, you will be so much better off if you just make some sacrifices or even if you just take some, make some other decisions with your finances, um, choose some things that might be less popular to position yourself well for the future. Uh, 24 months ago, I woke up and realized that we were $140,000 in non-mortgage debt through credit cards, car loans, student loans, uh, you name it, and uh, I was scared. Uh, we were living paycheck to paycheck. We had a son who was in college uh, trying to figure out how to pay for that. And uh, we were scared. I was scared. And I had not been talking to Shannon uh, about where we were at. We were not in communication. Even though we'd been married for uh, 25 years, uh, we were not talking regularly about our finances and uh, realized that I'd made a lot of poor decisions and asked God for help. And fortunately, in a, in a fairly short time after that, he brought uh, Dave Ramsey's book, Total Money Makeover, into my life. I read it, and it kind of opened my eyes to a lot of things that I had not been doing well, and uh, started to put a plan together of how we were going to get ourselves out of the situation we were in. Just part of my story has been, because I was able to graduate from college debt-free, I was free, right, to be able to kind of pursue some of those things that were on my heart. I was able to start a small business and pursue what I had studied, but also what I love to do, which is working with kids and working with languages. And that wouldn't have been possible if I was enslaved to debt. So I think it's just as we keep going through the baby steps and now with the fully funded emergency fund and working on retirement, we're able to cash flow. We're about to have our second go through college. And then we have a piece with able to do that. Um, some contentment definitely in our life for sure. Yeah, and, and it's interesting, Shannon just said uh, peace and contentment, and I think that's a key uh, element to when you are financially free. Uh, we no longer have that stress of uh, being in debt, uh, living paycheck to paycheck. Shannon and I have been uh, together actually for 30 years, and this is the happiest that we've been in that period. We are talking more than we ever have. We are excited about our future and our goals and our dreams, having a great retirement ahead of us, teaching our kids how to uh, live correctly and smartly from day one, be able to give a lot more than we have in the past. And so all of this has uh, been simply because we have finally gotten our financial house in order uh, through the FPU process. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, we will reap if, capital I, capital F, bold underscore italic, if we don't faint. If I was translating that just in my regular language, like I talk every day, I would say this. Let us not get so unbelievably tired of doing the things that we know we're supposed to do. Let us not just get exhausted that we say, oh, I don't have the trust anymore and I want to quit. 
For in due time, it may not be in my season that I think, but in God's sovereign control, we will see his dreams come to reality and fruition in our life if, and that's a big if, we don't give up. The last nine weeks or so, we've had this bridge up on the platform, and we said it's a symbol of the journey that we have to take to realize God's dreams in our life. We said on one side is God's dreams, on the other side is us. And then many times on that cross the bridge, on that journey, there are things that want to get in the way that, that kill God's dreams, that keep us from accelerating into what God wants us to do. And I've had this question, Brian, why are you so passionate about this? I think it's a good question. The answer to that question simply is this, is because too many people, too many people who are sons and daughters of the almighty God are living life in a way like a son and a daughter don't have to live. Prince and princesses of the king of kings and the Lord of lords are unable in many ways to live the life that Jesus died for and we're watching God's dreams sort of wither away in their life because they're not grasping how God wants them to live. He's not grasping or I'm not grasping how Jesus asks us to live. And so in the light of that, I had someone ask me a question then. Okay, Brian, because we're we're a culture that looks for a silver bullet, right? If you're talking to someone, you just want someone to land the plane. Give me one thing if you can. Say, Brian, if you had and could get it down to one thing, one thing that more often than not gets in the way of traveling the bridge from one side to the other, the thing that gets in the way about whether or not God's dreams lives or dies, whether we accelerate or we live the life of Captain Decelerate, instead of having freedom and peace and abundant living, we have slavery and anxiety and meager living. What would it be? Now, when the question was asked to me, the first thing I thought was my biggest issue. Now, I have lots of issues. We are aware of that here, right? But I've shared this publicly that that one of the things that years ago God revealed to me is that me reveling in being a control freak is not a good thing. And that he showed me that I don't have a control problem. I have a sin problem that shows up in control. Now, some of you who are also control freaks, you can join me at my office. And we can work through this together as God walks and heals ourselves in that. So that was my natural first reaction. However, after giving it a little bit more thought, there was something behind it. Something behind it that was a little bit deeper. It was a five-letter word. And where we choose to put this five-letter word will make the biggest determination about whether God's dreams lives or dies, whether we accelerate or decelerate. And it's a five-letter word called trust. Do we have it and where do we put it? Because in life, when we're trying to pursue God's dreams, we're trying to do what he wants us to do, when it gets hard, and it does get hard, when it gets difficult, and it will get difficult, When it gets confusing, and oftentimes it is, in those moments, our trust is tested. And how we live from that trust will affect whether we can live from God's dreams. And some of us in this room struggle more than others about believing in this fact that God's dreams can come true. You're like me. There's something in your background, there's something in your experiences that's begun to color a little bit of your thought process so that when other people come in your life and they say, hey, you're kind of pessimistic, you're like, I'm not pessimistic, I'm realistic. I'm not gonna get my hopes up too much because life has a way of slapping us down. Anyone know that reality? However, the problem is, is that when I begin to allow that way of thinking into my life, my trust to a little bit of wane in God, what happens is is that's when I begin to see God's dreams for my life begin to wither and die and I don't accelerate and I begin to decelerate from what God has. And if that wasn't enough, what happens next is a little bit more, let's just say, dangerous. Because the dreams that God plants in our heart, they will still sit there long after we move our trust from God to somewhere else. And what will happen in that heart-shaped hole is that when we're not trying to fill it with God, we will then try to fill it with other things to try to get God's dreams in different ways. It is basically the sweet and low of life. I've shared this with you. This is my preferred artificial sweetener. I'm saying this right now, and my wife is judging me with her eyes. It is. It's my preferred artificial sweetener. I've been known to keep some in my pocket. So if I go to a coffee shop, and I know which ones are around here, that don't carry this, I can bring my own. And I know good, well-meaning health people tell me, Brian, 
you know what? This isn't real, and in fact, it might cause health problems. And I think to myself, that's okay. I'm going to die from something. (laughs) Why? Because I like it. Some of us have moved away from trusting God, and that hole has still been there, and we've been beginning to fill it in with artificial things. And for a while, it will be good, but much like most likely what this is gonna lead to, if I'm not careful, I can guarantee you from a spiritual level, it will lead to death of God's dreams. And I don't want that for you. So here's what I'm gonna do this morning for you. I want to encourage you this morning. I want you to leave this place with your heart and your mind in line with the fact that if I trust God and I lean into him and I follow him, that in due season, I will actually reap if I don't give up. Some of you need to be encouraged today. I'll tell you this. My wife, God has given her for so many good reasons in my life. We were just having this conversation yesterday. She's like, Brian, you're not so great at encouraging. (laughs) Encourage me some. And I'm not that good at it, truthfully. I have fallen into the category in my life in counseling and everything. I like to call it the suck it up buttercup sort of theology. (laughs) I'm not saying it's good. It's just my natural bent. And so many times I don't speak encouragement into her life. And this morning I know that it's hard and it's difficult what some of you are going through. But what I want to do is I want to speak the truth of God into our lives so that we leave encouraged to do that which we cannot do on our own and to put our trust in the place it deserves. Can we do that? I want to pray. God, help me and do what only you can. Help us receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you have Bibles, I'm going to be in two places. I've already talked Galatians chapter 6. The next place I'm going to be this morning is in the book of Matthew chapter 6. And you can open them up right there in Matthew chapter 6. Or if you would prefer a copy, a hard one in your hand, you don't have one, just let someone who's walking around know and they'll hand you a copy. But in Matthew chapter 6, it sits right smack dab in the middle of Jesus' most famous sermon. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7 of the book of Matthew records it for us. There's a whole bunch of people listening to Jesus speak. And right in the middle of the body of his sermon, Jesus kind of pauses and stops. And he tells the people this, look, stop trying to do the impossible. Just stop it. And this is how he says it in verse 24 of Matthew chapter 6. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other or... He'll be devoted to the one and he will despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The actual term there is mammon, which is a whole lot more than money. It means stuff. You know what no one means in the Greek? No one. Yet the reality of it is we tend to be people that have sort of this over-exaggerated teenage boy view of what we can do. Now, I used to be a teenage boy. But I I look back and I think about some of the things I thought I could do as a teenager. And I begin to see it bubbling up in my eight-year-old son. I've said this before, that what my daughter chooses to go around, my son tries to go through. And so I was having this conversation around a a friend of mine who is a therapist. And she said, Brian, well, let me help you explain that. Did you know that the part of the brain in the male that develops last into the early 20s and sometimes mid-20s, that part that develops last is the same part of the brain in the male that handles impulse control. It totally makes sense now, right? (laughs) See, guys, it's not our fault. Just look at someone around you and say, you wanna do that? Why? Because we understand that we still had to make a choice. Some of us, while we've grown past our mid-20s and we've understood from a physical level why certain things make sense and certain things don't make sense, we still have a little bit of an undeveloped impulse control area when it comes to our spiritual brain and the fact that we think we can do the impossible. You quote scriptures like, well, with God, all things are possible. Yes, all things are possible with God except for ungodly things because he's encounter his character. And so God himself, Jesus is saying right here, no one can serve Two masters. Now, notice it's not saying that no one can have two masters. It's saying you just can't serve two masters. In fact, I'd like to think in my life, unfortunately, that I've many times had more than two masters. Maybe I've had four. 
Maybe some pride or fear have been masters over me. Or in this case, very specifically, what Jesus is referring to illustratively as we have been talking about this, that too often in life, when we get our stuff in the wrong position, is that we are people that wind up not being able to serve both stuff and Jesus well. How about this happen a few times, both with adults and with teenagers come into my office that illustrate the fact that they have a desire to do something and they actually belong to two separate people, but they can't serve them well and it has to do with their parents. People in their 50s and 60s who have two adult parents and those two adult parents aren't on the same page and the kid gets caught in the middle. Or teenagers who by no fault of their own have found themselves caught in the middle between parents who both love them but have differing agendas proving that they could belong to two different people but they certainly couldn't serve two different people. Now in the case of parents, we're not trying to draw one into being Jesus and one being mammon or one being money or one being stuff but it points out the tension that often happens in our life when we can't love everything or both equally and when we try to love both Jesus and stuff What happens is, is that this impossible task comes up, and the result is always this, is that we have to choose one of them over the other. We can't choose both, because the result is, is that when we try to choose both, we don't serve both of them well, and we wind up with a split loyalty. Yet, over and over again, we see difficulty and split loyalty in Jesus saying, no one can, and we see it as a challenge. Remember Pastor Will talking one time when I was talking to him about when he was a teenager, when he was uh, swimming across the Potomac River and he saw a sign that said, don't do this, people die. And his natural thought was, other people, not me. We often can think about this idea of scripture and we think no one and we think other people are no one, not us. We can do that which scripture says is not possible. We can split our loyalty. Now, you're like, Brian, you said you were going to be encouraging. And right now, we're about 12 minutes in or so, some of you are clocking me, and you go, I've not heard an encouraging word yet. I want you to hold on to that. It's coming. But you have to know where not trust leads to in order to be properly encouraged to go where trust calls us to go. We got to set that up. Because What happens is, is not that we literally say, I've never heard anyone say this. I've not said this, where I'm gonna physically say, God, I'm not gonna trust you. But what happens is, is that when Jesus comes into my life, and in a moment where he begins to ask me to open up my hands to walk across to the other side of the bridge, and it begins to threaten something in me that I hold valuable, even if I know intellectually that what he's gonna give me on the other side of that bridge is better than what I hold, Many times, my true split loyalty comes up, and I don't want to give up what I have to gain what I could get. And it's illustrated a lot in this picture that I stumbled across recently. I think we look at that picture, and we say, come on, kid. Give that teddy bear over to Jesus. He's got the big one behind his back. It's so much better. Yet, how many times do we find ourselves with our own sort of metaphorical teddy bears where where Jesus is saying, hey, you need to kind of give this up. But we're having trust issues that really what he has for us is better than what we have in our hands. This actually, and I brought him before, is my teddy bear from a kid. This is Timmy, and he is valuable to me. It's not because I could sell him for anything more than $2 at a garage sale. But he has memories, he has emotions, he has innocence, he has all kinds of things tied. Look, I know this is sad to say, but I'm a 40-some-year-old man that has a teddy bear still in his bedroom. Don't judge me. (laughs) But I do. In fact, it means a lot. In fact, if you tried to mess with Timmy, it'd be a problem. I brought him for the sermon that I brought him for one time. And I put him over here afterwards, and someone that I knew wanted to test me on what I said, like, don't mess with Timmy. And I saw him start to mess with Timmy, and I thought to myself, what will the paper say when it realizes a pastor punched a parishioner? (laughs) I mean, don't do that. Why? Is it because he is valuable in a standpoint of finance? No, it's because there's an emotion attached to him that makes me very unwilling to want to give him up. Now, hold that, right? Because in our metaphorical teddy bears... 
We have a lot of emotion attached to a lot of things that we began to believe. And when those emotions come in, it's not that emotions are bad, they're good, but when they contrast what is best for us from by, by God, they're really bad masters. It was illustrated a little bit a moment ago in the video. Kayla Rumford, um, when she shot that video, there's a part of that video that we edited out that I wanted to talk about here this morning. That talked about how she had to make a decision because of her situation that had some emotional tension to it because she understood in her financial situation that she was not going to be able to go typically like the normal four-year college scenario that many people push towards and not have a lot of debt. And so she made in Northern Virginia, in the high school peer pressure environment that often is a very unpopular decision, she decided to go to community college for the first two years. Now, she still wound up going to a four-year institution and got a great degree. And if she didn't tell you she went to community college, no one would know. But around her, and this isn't a sermon about why you should choose community college over state institutions. That's not what this is about. But what I am telling you is this, is that she understood the financial situation she was in, and she had to deal with the possibilities of the dreams that she could have or dealing with the emotional teddy bear of what it meant to do something different than other people would. Did you know that in the United States of America, the average college student graduates with $40,000 in debt? I want you to do the math on this for a moment, okay? If they go four years, and we know many times it's five years, if it's four years, that means on typical average for every month they spend in school, they lose $1,000 into debt. When they get out of school, and there's so many people who aren't paying off those debts, but if they pay them off at the typical 10-year rate at the typical amount of interest, it's a $52,000 investment that she realized, I could pay off $52,000 or I can make a different decision and do this way. But it requires me to follow after some stewardship principles of giving up a teddy bear that's really important to me and the feel around everyone else to get to that dream. And I wonder many times if it's about you and me and our lives, what are the teddy bears we're holding on that have lots of emotions to it, but we're allowing those to rule our decisions. And as a result, we don't get to the other side of God's dreams because we won't give them up for something that he has better. And when we don't give them up, Jesus has a word for what that is. It's called slavery. When we make these decisions that says, God, I'm not going to trust you in your way of dealing with all kinds of things, fear, fear, or complacency, or finances, or my marriage. We wind up in a sense of slavery to those things that God never wants us to be enslaved to. Financially, when we make those sort of decisions, what happens all the time is we wind up doing a whole bunch of jobs that we hate. I can't tell you how many people I know who hate every day getting up and going to do what they do because they realize they have to do it to survive because of decisions that they made on their own. This isn't about people who've not made poor decisions. This is self-inflicted stuff. Or people, they don't hate their job, but man, they would really love to do other things, but they can't because of other decisions and they're enslaved. Or what typically happens is this, is that I will gladly put off today to when I'm 67 and a half and can do it then. If you don't know this, 67 and a half or so is roughly the age now where Social Security says we can retire full-time. By the time I get there, it'll probably be 92. And so we live with this idea of delayed dreams or non-able dreams over and over again because we make choices to not give up our emotional teddy bears, to not do those sort of things. And when all this happens, what, what it is means we don't trust Jesus' dreams for our life enough to let go of this stuff, to allow him to be in control of, of our marriage, of our finances. There's a whole list of things that we have talked about and we continue to talk about. And as a result, we fill in the hole with other sort of artificial sweetener stuff that eventually will lead not to God's dreams, but a whole lot less than God's dreams. Now, We're now about 18 minutes in, and I still haven't given you a word of encouragement. You ready? Because you gotta be real about where you are and where you're gonna be before you can hope about the trust where you need to go. Can we agree with that? So let's talk about the different choice that we can make. It's the choice of Galatians chapter six of a diligent trust. And let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we do not faint. Do you know why Paul, through the power of the Holy Spirit, had to say, let us not grow weary? 
It's because he recognized it's hard. And we can get tired and we will want to give up. The dream for our church, you see it on your bulletin, you see it on the website, you see it on the walls. It's simply this, a spirit-directed church discipling people to know Jesus as Lord. What does that mean? That means that anytime the spirit says, do this, we say yes. He says, lead here, we follow. He says, go, we say go. He says, stay, we say stay. And there's not a moment where we ever pause or we ever hesitate because we have full trust and we're fully positioned to do what he wants us to do. That's the dream. That's the discipleship that he's calling us all into, what it means to fully devoted followers of God. And why we're talking about this, especially as we're talking about finances, is not because we want you to give money to this church. I want you to be clear. God will take care of his church, period, nonstop. It is Jesus' bride. No one loves Christian Fellowship Church more than Jesus. And Jesus will take care of Christian Fellowship Church. However, he also loves the people that make this the church and he wants God's dreams for them. The reason why we're talking about this sort of stuff and we're poking into areas people don't like us poking into. We get uncomfortable around finance. I know for a fact that there are people over the last five weeks have chosen not to gather on Sunday because this, this conversation makes them uncomfortable. I'm not saying that at all to shame them. If you're listening on Facebook right now and you happen to be one of those people, that this statement is not a shaming statement. But what it is is what happens is because churches have too often talked about this as sort of a stick up for giving to the church and not talking about as a way to get God's dreams for your life. And because culture has told us that the only thing or only one who knows anything about finances or any other way of living is the Captain Decelerate handbook, we buy into this so that when we talk about it as a church, we get uncomfortable. We are not talking about this for you to feel like that you have been wholly sort of guilted into doing something, but rather we're talking about this because we're deeply passionate for you and everyone who calls this place home to live God's dreams for your life. That's why we had this video up of Kayla. You know, the decision she made wasn't easy, but now, because see, hindsight's 20, 20 right? Now looking back at the hard decisions she made, now looking back at choosing to go this when other people were doing this, she's graduated from her master's and she doesn't have any debt and now she can start a small business helping kids who don't know English, which is her passion, to integrate better into our culture and society and to have hope and to be Jesus' hands and feet at a job that doesn't pay much but she doesn't have to take a job that pays much because she's not $50,000 in debt. She could live out God's dreams but was it hard? Absolutely. But was it worth it? On the other side of the bridge, we always know it's worth it. It's just getting there. Can we agree? And for a lot of us, we're not on the other side of the bridge. We're on this side. Heck, we're not even on the platform. Someone said, he just said heck in church. I did. Don't judge me for that. It's Hebrew. Somewhere. Or we're halfway across, whatever it might be. You know, there's another story up there, Brad and Shannon. I asked them, almost begged them to tell their story. Because some of us think we're so far gone. We've made such poor mistakes on special finances that God can't back. $140,000 is a lot of stuff, folks. But over diligence and following God's plan and God's wisdom, they're able to get out of that. But that's not why I wanted to share that. Now, they asked me not to share this, and I'm completely ignoring their request. Because they don't want to be held up as someone who's doing something special or certain special people. But I have to tell you something. As God began to work in their life and they began to experience freedom and knew what it's like to live in a place, not just of intention, but position to follow God's dreams in their life, they want it for other people. So they sponsored 100 people for scholarships for the Accelerate program. They came up, they didn't want their names, and they still don't like the fact that I'm giving their names. I'm not giving their names for that glory. I'm giving that. Wouldn't you like to be a church, a people, who are able to go pursue whatever God lays on our heart because we have chosen to trust him and do the things that need to be done so that God's dreams actually become reality for us? What would it look like, not just for individuals, for a whole church to be that way? This is an amazing story in the book of Exodus chapter 36. In Exodus chapter 36, the people of God have this passion that they want to build a tabernacle for God. Now, I want to be really clear. This has nothing to do with our move. This is just what God laid on them, okay? 
God's blessing our move and doing this debt free. He's doing that. But I want you to understand this about the tabernacle. They have this passion, and so they want to build a place for, for God's presence to reside in the Old Testament. So they start doing it, and they start doing it so much that in verse 7 of chapter 36 of Exodus, it says this, so the people were restrained from bringing, for the material they had was sufficient to do all the work and more. Now catch this. Moses had to tell people, stop giving. We got it. Go find somewhere else to give. Now, as we did mention, if you're new here, you can see it out in the lobby and it's online and we'll be continuing to talk more about this over the next several months. We've agreed as a church to, to sell our property and move about three or so odd miles away right by the, uh, the one Loudon line, the gathering there at Ashbrook and Russell Branch. And by God's grace, we're gonna build a new place and be completely debt free. Now, that decision is was and will be hard. Why though? Because at one point we looked at it and we said, okay, we owe about $4.2 million to the church. Can we pay for that? Sure we can. We can have that. We can take care of that. And we looked and said, over the next five years, we have about $5 million more work that we need to do. 4.2 plus five, 9.2. Can we do that? Yes. But what opportunity would be lost for us to move the kingdom forward when we were doing 9.2 in a building when, if God so moved us and asked us to walk across a bridge, we could just move three miles down the road, have something brand new, and be in no debt and have $9.2 million to do towards kingdom work? I mean, what would it look like if we went down to one of our partners, Nova HTI, the Human Trafficking Initiative, and folks, there are people, women and boys, girls and men, right here in Loudoun County being trafficked. For labor in other areas, if you know what I'm saying. What would it look like to partner with them in such a way that after a while, Nova HDI had to say, hey, stop helping us. You have helped us enough. Go find another place. And so then we go and we partner with Mosaic Pregnancy Center, one of our partners here. We go and we partner with Mosaic, who every day is on the front line of making sure that life happens as God intends it. When men and women are tempted to believe that the, the thing it carrying around in that lady's belly is not real. Yes, it is. It's real and it's life and it's important to God because God made it and printed his image on it. What if we came along them and we helped them and they said, you know what? Stop helping. You've helped enough. Go find some others. So then we start, just like the Bible says, let's go help the widows. And the widow's like, you know what? We ran out of widows in our church. Go find some more widows in other places. And we have orphans that need places to stay. We run out of that. Go find orphans in Nicaragua. Go find them in Puerto Rico. Or go find them in Peru or Chile or wherever God may lead. And we said to ourselves, we are so blessed by God that we had to be a people that continue blessing other people. I don't know about you, but I want to be that church. But it's not going to be easy. Where will we put our trust? But when we put it in the right place, things like what's gonna happen today at 3.30 can happen all the time. Take a look. Today at 3.30, 
we're gonna be at the gym. And we're gonna provide 60,000 meals for kids around the world. And we've had to ask zero from this church to give anything more towards it. Something that we're able to do this year that we wouldn't have been able to do last year because this year we're a little more free than we were last. What if it looked like a place that was saying, we are so free, we're so trusting that people had to stop saying, you know what, go find other people to help. Do you think that the people of God who are part of that church would be spirit followers? I think so. And do you think that the world around us that would see the impact that Christian Fellowship was making would want to say, I don't know what it is about them, but I want to find out? My guess is absolutely they would. But it's hard. It requires doing things that we don't like to do sometimes. To sacrifice. To be willing to give up our emotional teddy bears. And sometimes when we give them up at first, it's hard walking across that bridge. And so here's what I want to do. If you today, right now, are in that struggle personally that I know that I've been in over and over again now over the last six years. When I want to see God do something and it doesn't work in my time. Or I begin to waver in my trust. Or I begin to want to try to take control. I need to be reminded. I need to be encouraged. I need to be told this example that yes, We can endure. We can not give up. We can move forward, not because of anything that we have, but because of the words that we said at the very beginning of this Accelerate series. When when Paul from prison in Philippians chapter four said this, I can do all things through him, Jesus, who gives me strength. He's saying I don't find contentment or trust in my stuff or situations. I find it in Jesus. I can get soul rest from him. And I can follow him and I can do what he asks, but that only happens from him. We can endure the challenges. We can do the hard, the hard things. We can give up now what we're gonna gain more in the future, the teddy bears of life, if we allow Jesus to give us strength. But we can't do it in our own power. I love this song. We're gonna sing it in just a moment. It's called A Beautiful Name. These are the words. You, with talking about Jesus, have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever. God, you reign Yours, it's the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus, that beautiful name. Listen. It says that we need to endure, but we will reap in due season if we faint not. But we also realize that there's this temptation in our life to try to want to do the impossible. But through the power of Jesus Christ, what we can know is that we can have strength to realize we can't do the impossible and trust him to do what he wants to do. Say, God, here's my teddy bears. We can trust him to not want to substitute stuff or things or people or situations or anything for him. To endure when we're making difficult decisions, financial or emotional decisions, strength to allow Jesus' dreams to become reality in our life, not just about finances, but some of us need to see Jesus' dreams become reality in our life when it comes to our marriages, and we need to trust Him and let Him be in control. Some of us need to let Jesus' dreams come reality in our life when it comes to our work situations, when it comes to our relationship with friends, when it comes to a myriad of things that Jesus can do if we choose to trust him and to start that journey walking across the bridge for God's dreams to become reality in our life. So here's what I want to do today. I want to encourage you to trust him. He did not send Jesus to this earth to die for us so that we couldn't trust him in our difficult moments of wanting to give up the teddy bears of our life. No one said he promises that if we give it up and we trust him, that which is behind him is so much better. It's his dream. But for some of us today, we've given up. But here's the good news. God's a God of second chances. Third chances. In my case, 1,327 chances plus many more. He loves you. Step into that. If you're in the middle of it, you've been, you've been trying to trust him in whatever situation it is, financial or otherwise, and you've been wanting to quit and wanting to stop, today, don't quit. Do not grow weary. Let us not quit. In well-doing and following after what Jesus wants and trusting him for in due season, we will reap God's dreams for us.
us if we do not, do not, do not, do not give up. God, only in your power can we do this. But thank you that you have given us through your spirit to endure. And thank you that your promise says our endurance and not giving up will be worth it. God, thank you that your dreams for us can become our reality if we choose to trust and follow in Jesus' name.